Hello, Sarah. I'm delighted to be chatting with you. Double Oscar winner, screenwriter, filmmaker, producer, musician, novelist. How is yes. life in New York? <laughs> I think that's about it. Rabbit, yeah. rabbit lover. That's another one. Another one. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of all of those titles suits you best? A writer? Would a writer surmise or musician, maybe? No, storyteller. Okay. And that yeah. pretty much encompasses everything. Yeah, true. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better. So, yeah. um, and and even as a writer, I think of myself not as an author, but I like to spin a good tale. I'm one of those. Okay. Besides besides being a storyteller, do you, what do you do for hobbies? What do you do to relax? I write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a writing fool. I'm one of those annoying people for whom writing is a real pleasure. But I guess I do get out in the garden now and then, and I like to swim. Okay. So. You, you can t- I've been dipping in and out of your excellent blog as well on your website. Oh. Is, is it at, ho- at Home with a Ghost? Is this a memoir? Is this going to come out in a book form in the near future? I would like it to. At present, it, I, I don't. I need a new literary agent, and I'm waiting to finish my current book before I start. Um, beating the bushes for that and then I will be able to say hey there's a book length memoir if you're interested on my blog but at present it's actually more effective on a blog because it has all of these links to um, you know to videos and and um, songs yeah 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 and you just can't do that in a book I don't know why I don't know why ebooks don't do that it it makes sense to me yes yeah now I think about it, I, I think that's maybe why I'm enjoying the blog. I'm dipping in and out, and there's lots of different sort of audio and visual yeah. material. So it makes it better in a way than your average book, yeah. your hardback book. Yeah, and on my blog, it's free. Oh, so. yeah, of course, yeah, bonus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had thought that I started blogging to promote my previous book um, called Jane Was Here, yeah. and I'd never had a blog before, and I was told I should have one um, in order to promote the book. Yeah. But I got bored after a few entries, and I decided to start telling a story that would probably be done in about five chapters, and it ended up being about 55 chapters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's so long. Yeah, But you, you know, these chats that I have, they're normally straightforward. We talk to a writer about the novels or a screenwriter about the film. With you, there's such a brilliant mix of creative experiences. Can we split this into three sections? Maybe talk about your film work first, the award-winning film work, and then your fiction writing, and end up talking about your music. It's your show. Oh, brilliant. Well, tell me how you got started as a filmmaker. An Oscar at such an early age for the documentary Marjo back in 1972. Yeah. How did you I, get started? Well, I'd already made the decision to be a writer at age 14. Oh. So that gave me an early start as far as um, practicing. And I did start to practice from that time on. Uh, I, in fact, dropped out of college because I was eager to get started writing instead of studying. Um, And I thought I was ready uh, in terms of, you know, my skills. Uh, And that led to a job at a newspaper called The Village Voice, which was, this is 1969. And it was a very hip place to be. And also it put me in connection with um, uh, a man soon to become my boyfriend, but also my boss. And I used to ghostwrite his column in the paper. And I just quit because I said, I don't want to be a journalist. I need to get going. And um, had decided at that point that I should try movies because I thought that I could become a success there faster than if I just started out as a starving young novelist. Um, sort of arrogant, but you, know, you are at that age. Well, it was the right decision by the looks of it. You know, an Oscar. Well, the thing was that um, I did write a script. Uh, it, I did get an agent and my boyfriend slash boss, former boss said, um, Oh, uh, well, looks like you've got a foothold in the business. So I think I'd like to make a movie too. Let's make one together. And um, he brought home some material about a, a, a born again evangelist. And believe me, nothing much was known in the 
northern urban areas about the Bible Belt. So this was very fresh stuff. And um, a young evangelist had come to him wanting to sort of blow the lid on what his scam was. Um, and my boyfriend said, oh, well, we should give this to and he named a documentarian team. And I said, no, let's us do it. Because it was a story that could not be told any other way than as a documentary, because nobody would believe it. Okay. Uh, so that became uh, our project. And we went for financing to probably the only place on earth that would ever give us to inexperienced filmmakers the money to do a documentary, uh, which weren't very successful in any way. Um, but this was a distributor of documentaries, pretty much the only one in the U.S. at the time. And he went for it. Um, so it was from the point of pitching it to actually being uh, on set, filming it was probably six months. Yeah. yeah. So, so it all went so fast that um, before I knew it, we had an Oscar nomination and we knew we were going to win because of the quality of the yeah. uh the competition and uh it just felt weird to me uh, uh, like it i thought it was funny like, you yeah. know i actually laughed when i picked that thing up because <laughs> it just seemed like such a fluke i was only like 25 years old yeah. um but it did not lead to other documentaries again fiction is my beat i didn't yeah. really have any interest in doing another one unless i had run across a story like that and 30 years later i did i ran across another guy who was a perfect subject for a documentary but you couldn't possibly make a, a scripted film out of it because um again i watched, I watched it today yeah I'd, Nobody ne would I'd, I'd never heard of it. I'd never heard. Of it. I was sort of I thought, very unique, very much an individual. Yeah, yeah. It, it was about a man who was kind of the opposite of the uh, crooked evangelist. Um, he was a truth teller, and he he was very uncompromising about presenting his um, his work in to uh, an audience on the street uh, in the in the park. Um, it was a one man opera in a made up language um, with a made up you know, culture that it came from. Yeah. And he not only sang all the parts, but he played violin at the same time while dancing. Yeah. Uh, again, you, you could not invent that. <laughs> and I wanted as many people as possible to see him do it because there was only one person on earth who yeah. could have pulled that off. Yeah, extremely talented man. Thoth, Thoth. Is that how you pronounce it? Thoth. Thoth. Thoth, yes, Thoth. like like apple thoth, he said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but moving on to another film, you wrote the screenplay for nine and a half weeks, and I felt that was a film that made stars out of Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke back in eight, 1986. Was there yeah. an inkling that the film would become such a cult film as it is now? Well, I think everyone hoped that it would be more than a cult film. Um, mm -hmm because the director adrian line was coming off of the his big hit flash dance yeah, and yeah. it was a major studio putting yeah. up major money yeah. he insisted on these two well mickey rourke was known but as a as a character actor hmm. uh not as a romantic lead and kim bassinger was not well known at all um a lot of actresses turned it down it was just too yeah. too raunchy too erotic for them yeah okay yeah. Um, and I don't think Adrian ever thought that I, I think he really misconstrued America, yeah. that there is this vein of, of Puritanism with them. Um, you know, they they could not be more uninhibited behind closed doors. Oh, yeah, yeah. But there is this sanctimonious part of us um that says you know that's filthy you know we can't have that in our movie theaters yeah. so it was actually uh his mistaking our our national psyche to think that it would be a hit um and and yet it was extremely commercial stuff because no one was making these movies at all yeah. and he did it with such style yeah um uh, so even i didn't really anticipate i knew the critics were going to roast it but I didn't know that people wouldn't show up at the theaters. Yeah, watch it at and, home, didn't they? I think. Whatever. Well, it took a while for it to come out in video, but yeah. at the, on the year that it came out, 
I think it was uh, 70 something, um, no, 80, 81 or something like that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it took a long time for it to come to video. And uh, in the meantime, it had that reputation yeah. in Europe, on the contrary, <laughs> where people are a little more uh, uh, appreciative of that stuff. It was not just a hit. It was huge. And indeed, when I when we moved to France to make another film in 89, uh, it was still playing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke were like the, you know, hot. I mean, yeah. they were considered hot, whereas they were still not very well known in the States mm. uh, until the video came out. And then nobody was afraid of being seen going, going into a theater. They could just rent it and take it home. Yeah. And then it found its audience. Then yeah. it became huge moving forward slightly the hairy bird film 1998 i've read that this is autobiographical how much of this was based on your own background perhaps you your, your school years uh yes it was about a an all-girls school in 1963 yeah. where the students learn that the school is going co-ed um, and it's what the girls do um you know this this one group of girls uh, plots to um, blow up the plans to make it go co-ed. It's a teen <laughs> comedy. Um, and it was made under the title of Harry Bird, but subsequently had two more titles, thanks to Harvey Weinstein, yeah, um, who bought the U.S. distribution rights and then refused to release it. What? Well, why would he do that? <laughs> well, that is the big mystery, and there are many theories. But in my opinion, it's because um there was a teacher character in it who was preying on young girls who was oh, a ah, sexual predator and i yeah. think he wanted to bury it mm, yeah i can see echoes of that because that was not a, a a character you had ever seen yeah uh, and yet that was his modus operandi so i think that's why he did it because it, it made no sense you know he lost a lot of money by doing that he paid a lot of money for it yeah so, um, but in other countries, it did very well, including Canada, where it yep. was shot. Yep. A big hit in Australia under the original title, The Hairy Bird. But people in America now know it as All I Want to Do. Uh, it was just yanked off of screen streaming. You could stream it and then suddenly disappeared this year. Um, and the producers found out that it was because Harvey Weinstein's uh, option had finally lapsed oh yeah finally so the control of it comes back to us and we are going to be getting it back up again because it does have a cult following okay. um, yeah. when when it went to video again yeah. it found its audience another film i watched last night again i think about the third time harrison ford and the what lies beneath based on yeah. a story written by yourself was, was this a ghost story or was it, it's a thriller it looks sort of like like a Hitchcock type of film, mm -hmm. the way I understand it. But the elements of you know spookiness in there of ghosts was that intended as a as a, a ghost story when you wrote this. Uh, even more so. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you that the story credit uh, is a union thing. Um, yeah. It you automatically get a story credit if you wrote the original screenplay. Right. And I did. And okay. I. Yeah, I didn't ask for a co-screenwriting credit because um, the second writer had taken it so far afield of, of what I'd done. But the basic premise was there. And the reason was because um, the film that you saw was directed by Bob Zemeckis, you yeah, know, yeah. a great top filmmaker. He did Back to the Future, didn't he, I think, before that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. A, a lot of big films. Yeah. Big, big. Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I mean, the list goes oh, on. Oh. Um, and uh, he, in fact, was a good, a good friend and colleague of Steven Spielberg's. And mm -hmm. that's who I wrote the script for. Yeah. Wow. So when Steven decided not to do it, and the idea of the story actually was his. Yeah. Um, he wanted an empty nest couple who was dealing with a ghost yeah. um, uh, with the with the wife in particular being thought 
she was crazy yeah, that she yeah. was having a fantasy of a presence in the house because her daughters had left for college and yeah. the house was empty. Yeah. Um, and I was hired because I had had actual experiences with ghosts yeah. and Stephen wanted it to be the most realistic ghost story ever made and for the ghost to be quite normal. You know, mm -hmm. like a, a housewife, yeah. you know, who had uh, was still sticking around the house. So it was more about contact with a ghost, like third close encounters of the third okay. kind, contact yeah. and communication with the ghost, and the ghost and the human being helping each other to move on. Okay. So that's a very different film. It is. It's just a bit. I, I'd forgotten yeah. that there was jump moments on it. I, I, last time I saw it was about 10 years ago, and I'd forgotten those some skit scenes. I do, whoa, hang on a sec. <laughs> Jumped at me a bit there. <laughs> no, the, the new writer and the new director did a great job with it. They did. But it was not the movie that I wrote. Okay. And I don't resent that at all. I enjoyed um, watching the credits, though, you know, based on a story by Sarah. <laughs> wow. The, that's the union thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I was not going to take a credit at all. And they said, oh, no, you have to take this credit. It's automatic. Yeah. Okay. You want to meet my rabbit? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, please. Okay. Wow, that's a big rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Child, how, how big is the? Wow, huge ears. <laughs> Coming out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you for putting my book cover up. Oh, it looks looks great. I think I'm looking. I'll try and sit in the middle of them so it can be shown clearly. How long have you had this rabbit? How old is he? Uh, she's six now. Yeah. yeah. How, long, how long is that mature for a rabbit? I've never never owned one as a pet. Um, house rabbits that yeah. live indoors all the time can live up to 12 years. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So she's in a prime. Years. Yeah. Yeah, she's about 50. In okay. Human. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, now, now that I've got your novels behind me, Dry Hustle. So can we talk about both the books? Maybe Dry Hustle first. Okay. But dry Hustle. Um, is this based on chats that you've had with people working, ladies working in the industry? Yes, that was based on two real characters. Um, I was given an assignment by Cosmopolitan magazine wow. to hire myself into a dance hall on oh, Times yeah. Square in New York. Yeah, to find out why these places were still around. I mean, they were dime a dance for sailors, you know, they used to be that. And they wondered why in the uh this would be the mid 70s why they were still around so i did and it was clear that it was just um it became clear very quickly that i was expected to give guys hand jobs uh, under the table yeah, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> so i was sort of hiding out in the ladies room because <laughs> and, and covertly making notes <laughs> This pair of women came in who had also been in the in the pen with me, yeah. uh, and they said, "You're you know you're new, right?" Yeah. <laughs> I said, "Yeah," <laughs> and I said, "I don't want to do this." <laughs> they said, "Oh no, we'll teach you the dry hustle, which yeah. is the name of the book. Yeah. yeah, we'll teach you so you don't even have to touch them, and you'll make more money than anyone else in this place." Yeah. So I heard <laughs> that word dry hustle, and I immediately thought. That's that's the title of something. That's that's a story. Sounds and like a great title. This took a kill fee from um, Cosmo, and yeah. I traveled with these two con artists, these women, uh, yeah. across America as one of their team to learn exactly what they did and how they psychologically manipulated men into giving them money, while the men were all all thinking that they were going to get something sexual in return, yeah. but never never did so that i turned into uh my novel which sold in the movies right away along with my services as screenwriter yeah. and director and yeah. later that kind of blew up as often happens in the movie uh, business yeah um, but it it did very well as a book and the next one jane was here totally different genre mm. i think by now you can tell that i bounce all over the place no, i don't I'm i don't like I don't like to be categorized. So yeah, almost yeah. any film title you see, any book title, it's always something very different from what I've done before. Jane Was Here is not based on anything real. It is a reincarnation thriller. Okay. Um, 
there has been a crime committed 150 years before, and all the people involved have been reincarnated and, you know, far flung, but have been lured to this place by happenstance, to the one place where the crime happened yeah. and where karma can play out. And so it's for the reader to figure out until it's revealed which person in the present corresponds to which person in the past because both stories are being told concurrently okay. past and present that so, was fun totally different genre about the um you, on your website we mentioned this earlier uh sarah kerachan blogspot.com you write about being at home with a ghost yes I've, the bits i've read about it is this ghost is it still around is your granddad yes present yes. still yeah. still there still with you you know, I don't really need him anymore, but he checks in now and then and usually does something rather mischievous to announce his presence, <laughs> like, you know, splitting a mug of tea, you know, suddenly or yeah. or sma smashing light bulbs is another favorite, which I don't appreciate. But um, I, I read one part of the blog about an incident. You had a, you had a boyfriend come over and the lights are flickering constantly. <laughs> And you're saying, stop it. <laughs> How nervous would that make the boyfriend? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I think when I began to talk to it in front of him, <laughs> talk to the ghost in front of him is when he thought, well, maybe I should not have be dating this person. Yeah. Uh, giving off bad vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, there's another thing that, that you mentioned on, on within reading on the blog itself. There's an incident you you were hanging out with the I can't pronounce the name Nielsen Harry Nielsen, and yeah. you go and, to the Dakota apartments with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And... Oh, John was very much part of that whole experience because he and Harry were working on a an album together. John yeah. was producing Harry's album, and I was dating Harry at the time. There was an awful image as well. I think one, one, someone went to see a psychic, I think, mm, and they had yeah. a vision of John in blood, covered in yeah. blood. Yeah. That was a bit shocking, I, that, when I read that. Um, to me, too, because, I mean, Yoko, too, couldn't figure out what it meant. Um, mm. This would have been way before he died, I think, 1975 yeah. is the year when that happened. Yeah. Wow. And Yoko said, oh, you know, it's probably because of the miscarriages that I've had, yeah. which are actually, you know, bloody for a woman. It's logical, um, yeah. They couldn't think of anything else. Um, mm. But the the psychic said, he sleeps in blood. Wow. Those were his words that Yoko yeah. reported afterwards. And yeah. uh, after, she was very, very impressed. John was rather scared. Yeah, but he was to go uh but she kind of hired him on retainer after that yeah uh, I, I was the one who sent them to that psychic because i i thought he was amazing yeah uh, and i knew that yoko was very into the woo, -woo stuff okay so. an awful event six years later 1981 i think it was yeah. and he was shot awful yeah. yeah going back to you made three albums two albums but rca records as a singer songwriter House of Pain and Beat Around the Bush. Mm. Was this an area, would you have happily spent the full time as a musician? Are we always going to go back to writing and storytelling? You know, I, I didn't really have a... At, at the point that it was clear that my career was going to be kind of checkered. Mm. And, you know, I had the Oscar for the documentary, but I couldn't get work after that. So I turn to music and yeah. so I was going to ride that out as long as it took me um and so that lasted about three or four years um would I I think was a good thing that I didn't catch on a very good thing because yeah. that lifestyle was really ruinous for me yeah. um yeah especially keeping up with Harry and John my god oh, the amount no. of drugs and the drinking <laughs> oh, oh. and you know I did not have their capacity do you think you might not um, still be here then if you had gone down that particular no, I, line i do think i i would have od definitely yeah uh, oh. but it was also impossible to get any work done and you know they had a lot of money but i didn't yeah yeah, yeah. so <laughs> um 
Yeah, I, I I think it was a good thing. And the other thing was I didn't like to perform. Oh. I just didn't want to do it. And Harry, in fact, was kind of my idol because he didn't either. He, yeah. he got away with not performing. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll just be the female Nilsson. But it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I loved writing music. I loved yeah. singing and recording it. And that yeah. was it. Okay. So I was never going to go anywhere yeah. as long as I had that attitude. Okay. Um, and that's when I wrote my first novel. But, you know, yeah. I turned to that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, still moving closer to today, decades of demos, that's available now to download? They all are. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why, I've, I've read more around, the, maybe because it's more recent, the decades of demos. Um, they're all on Spotify and all those things, and, you know, you can download the whole record from any one of the online stores. Um Decades of Demos was self-released and it oh, was okay. just all the stuff that I'd been doing since my record contract ended. Yeah. Um, and also ever since the MIDI software came in, uh, you know, so I was no longer beholden to a producer and other uh, musicians, but I could play all the stuff myself and, and arrange the music the way I wanted. So um, there are some just simply piano voice demos in there, but there's a lot also of uh you know arranged and digital music your husband james lapine he's himself he's a multi-award winner yes he's a little surprise winner in fact in tony awards have you collaborated on a stage play or a screenplay project together i don't like to write with another person and we oh. did do a pilot for amazon once and and i hated it yeah uh you know i just <laughs> really you <laughs> I, I just feel like I, you know, I have to check everything with this other person, you know, oh, yeah. let myself go my own way. Yeah. Um, but uh, back in the late 80s, he did direct a screenplay that I wrote for my very favorite film that I ever, my favorite anything I ever wrote was the, a film called Impromptu with yeah. Hugh Grant. Yeah, and yeah. Davis and Emma Thompson. Yeah. This is 1989. It was shot in France, uh, and I adore that film. And my husband shot the script as written. Really, <laughs> that doesn't happen often. <laughs> Did you get so. to travel as well? Did you get to France yourself on the? On yes, set? yes. Yeah. Believe wow. me, they had the best food, you know, craft services on a film set I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, in fact, in the crew's contract that they would get. A, a a half bottle of wine with lunch. Wow! So yeah, yeah. we tried to get all all the work you really needed to do before lunch, because after that they were already talking about <laughs> getting home to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did some work in a French factory about ten years ago, and I was amazed myself with the lunch time. You know, with the lunch to the canteen, about a hundred people, and they're serving like half a bottle of wine with the meal, yeah. and people yeah. are just drinking as normally. I mean, yeah. if I start drinking that in the daytime, I'll either go to sleep or I want to carry on drinking. Oh, I couldn't, me too. like, stop and go back to work. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how much the working class is coddled, yeah, you true. know, in yeah. France. But yeah. God love them. Yes, yeah, so we did get to go to France for that. Brilliant, brilliant. Final question. What, what advice would you have for a starry-eyed newcomer, someone who's got ambitions to write, but they've got an idea in the head? I, I've, I've written one novel. And everybody I speak to, they say, well, I've got a novel in my head, but they don't do anything about it. How, how would you advise them to get started for writing? Well, I would say that you're a writer and they're not. Mm. Because how you get started is exactly as I did in, at the age of 14. You you write. You just keep writing. You keep writing. You keep, you keep honing your craft. Um, if you mean getting started in the business, that's another thing. Mm. A writer doesn't need permission to be a writer. You validate this, you validate yourself by writing and getting better. Who who encouraged you at the, at your early age, Sarah? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Who encouraged you? Who's you? Who gave you that you know motivation? Was it just from yourself? Did you have no, a good teacher no. backing you up? No, no one did. No? Um, no, I think my father was very nervous about it and said, "You you really should." get some secretarial skills oh, you know, dear. to fall back on. Yeah. <laughs> my mother was just didn't know anything about what the business of it was. And she just always was 
they both were cheering me on as long as I was in school, you know, yeah. and doing other things that might be useful yeah. to me, you know, but for all they knew, I would just get married and have children. Yeah. Um, no, the idea came to me because I had a much older boyfriend. Um, he was five years older than I at the age of 14. Yeah. And he had dropped out of Princeton um, University in order to write a novel. And I thought, oh, you can just do that. Yeah. You can just start writing. You know, nobody can prevent you from doing that. Yeah. And I th I think I'd be pretty good at that. But he was not encouraging. In fact, he didn't want to read my stuff. He didn't want me to ever talk about it. Wow. So, you know, that relationship kind of, it lasted in, until I finally realized he was never going to be supported. So it um, looks like time's caught up with us, but it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. And Thank you. Maybe we can keep in touch and maybe have another chat when the next project's released, when this, this memoir comes out in print, perhaps. Oh, yeah, because you don't even know what I'm doing now. What are you doing now? I'm writing libretto for a boy Broadway musical. What? I've never, I've never done that before. Yeah, it's really crazy. But we'll talk. Wow, that's uh, mad. That, that, I <laughs> took up that information from anyone. You've surprised me there. Shocking. That's, <laughs> that sounds, uh, that's a whole new direction. Yeah, I'm surprised too. Wow. So. Well, let's say uh, maybe six months down the line, we could maybe have another chat and tell me how you're getting on with that. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for having me and for thinking of me. That's and been an absolute noticing. pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>